It was just an ordinary day. We went to chow, and a young man had an incident with a correctional officer. I think he attempted to throw a tray at the officer. The Massachusetts Correctional Institution, Cedar Junction, was for a long time known as Walpole, a maximum security prison in Massachusetts, known to be one of the harshest in the country. Did you know this guy? I didn't know him personally, no. I, you know, he sat at a table that was couple uh, away from ours. The COs jumped on them. There was probably like five of them on this one kid. Riots, uprisings, hostage taking date back to at least 1959, just three years after its opening. Eric Williams started serving his time at Walpole in the late 90s. And other inmates started to say something, get off of them, and the superintendent was punched in the face. It just led to a big brawl. You know, my brother was there. They were trying to break my brother's fingers. They were just, you know, hitting us, and eight of us were actually charged. In 1991, Walpole opened the Department Disciplinary Unit, or DDU, a prison within the prison with 124 cells dedicated to what Massachusetts Correction deemed the worst of the worst. So, you know, two hours we were, we were in Walpole in 10 block, and that's solitary confinement with solid doors closed on you. The cell is, I think, smaller than the average bathroom, and you go there to await whatever punishment they have for you, that punishment being DDU. Starting from that night, Eric would spend the next eight years in solitary confinement. DDU was still some part of you that you probably didn't even know you had, but you'll know it's missing. I remember on plenty of occasions just waking up feeling like I was dead. I would block my window. I would hold my slot. I would put my arm out just so they could go get the move team. The move team would come, which is five or six correctional officers in shoulder pads, helmets, and a shield. They spray you with pepper spray mace. And they come in the cell. They restrain you, cuff you up, f*** you up, whatever they do. But I would do that. On purpose? On purpose. Because pain at least felt like life. Like when you're in there and you're just by yourself, you're like in a box, your mind is racing, and you know that this can't be life. It seemed like a dream. So human contact came from getting your head kicked in. And you're swollen up somewhere, you know, hey, <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> From Slate, this is Hi-Fi Nation, philosophy in story form. This season, crime and punishment. Recording from Vassar College, here's your host, Barry Lamb. As a criminal penalty in America, only death by hanging has lasted longer than solitary confinement. And even that's ended. So why is solitary still around? That's what I set to find out in this episode. The language we've used for imprisonment has changed. The penal code, penal labor, or penal colony is explicit about penalties. Prisons are a form of punishment. But then starting in 1820, we get this word, penitentiary, naming a place where sinners repent, acquiring the virtue of penitence. On this view, prisoners are lost souls seeking salvation and prisons are there to deliver it. And today we have this word, corrections, for what the prison system is supposed to be doing to people, correcting them. Solitary confinement has survived all of these changes in verbiage. It's always been a practicing feature of American criminal justice. Something about keeping a person in a box for 23 hours a day, for a decade, has struck Americans of many generations 
as the right response to criminal wrongdoing. Why is that? My name is Lisa Gunther, and I am Queen's National Scholar in Political Philosophy and Critical Prison Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Solitary confinement emerged in and through the penitentiary system. And so this was a liberal humanist enlightenment project of shifting away from the brutal punishments of physical beating or harm and capital punishment towards a form of punishment or accountability that would be more in line with the democratic ideals of the emerging U.S. republic. And so Benjamin Rush, one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence, was also a very enthusiastic penal reformer. And he was very against public punishments that he thought were degrading to people who were, for example, on a chain gang, forced to walk through a town and pelted with rotten fruits and vegetables and names. He thought this was degrading not only to the prisoner, but also to the to the public. It brought out the worst in people. And so the, the experiment with solitary confinement came out of an effort to find a way of holding people accountable for breaking the law that also respected their dignity as a human being and a child of God. The penitentiary is very much a religious project as much as a political project. Lisa Gunther believes that evolving conceptions of the self, what in philosophy we call theories of personal identity, are responsible for the emerging and continuing practices of solitary confinement. A strong mind-body dualism of the early modern period permeated the religious teachings of Quaker Christianity, which was the form of Christianity responsible for the design of Eastern State Penitentiary, the first American penitentiary, and a model for the next 200 years of prison design. Mind-body dualism is the view that the mind and body are, in principle, distinct substances. The mind is an essentially thinking thing, and the body an essentially extended thing. The self is identified with the mind, not the body. Their co-mingling in the corporeal, earthly world is also what is responsible for the corruption of the mind through the bodily appetites. Greed, lust, avarice, the appetites that lead to criminal conduct. The solution was the removal of the person, the mind, from earthly bodily stimulation, freeing it to operate with a kind of purity, leading to its penitence and salvation. But one of the things that happened almost immediately as this practice was implemented and these penitentiaries were built is that people came undone. They did not, by and large, have a spiritual death and resurrection. They underwent a kind of spiritual and psychological death without resurrection. Dementia was one of the, the terms in the early 19th century that was used to, to describe the sort of mental illness basically produced through long-term isolation. Fast forward to about a century and a half. We're now in post-World War II America with an emerging second wave of solitary confinement. At this point, we're in the early years of empirical social science and psychology, when behaviorism reigns supreme. Starting in the 1950s, around the time of the Korean War, there were reports that the Chinese had these techniques for breaking a person down and then putting them back together in a way that controlled their behavior and popularly understood as brainwashing. It was a topic of very intense psychiatric research funded by the military in large part. More technically would be understood as thought reform. The theory behind thought reform was that the right techniques of brainwashing and reprogramming, just like reformatting and reinstalling a hard drive, could not only allow you to program the perfect Cold War soldier, but also allow you to reprogram the criminal mind. These experiments in the 50s and 60s began in a military context, but were 
very quickly transposed into a prison context where the prison is a kind of laboratory for experimenting with a period of extreme sensory deprivation and social isolation, alternating with intensive group therapy, including attack therapy, where other prisoners would be expected to provide a social context and social pressure to tr change the behavior of someone who had been softened up through extreme isolation. And then you'd go back and forth between these situations of social isolation and social bombardment. The vision of personhood animating these behaviorist experiments in sensory deprivation, solitary confinement, and sensory overload and social overload is that the body is a, a kind of mechanism. There are inputs and outputs. If you can control the inputs or the environment, you should be able to control the outputs or the behavior. By the 1970s, there were prisoners who were litigating against what they named as a form of torture, cruel and unusual punishment. And so the 70s were a great period of successful prisoner litigation that put an end to many behaviorist experiments on people in prison. And yet solitary confinement didn't end. It just assumed a different official purpose. To this day, we continue to use the language of reform, maybe even reprogramming, and pretend that solitary confinement is part of the process of corrections. But Lisa Gunther doesn't think anyone believes this. Not the officials who implement it, not the policymakers that permit and fund it, and not the prisoners themselves. The animating motivation behind solitary confinement as it's practiced today is more of a supermax warehousing model, where the desire is no longer really to change the behavior of individuals, but rather just to manage populations. And so the prison and the solitary confinement unit becomes a space to incapacitate prisoners, to minimize the impact that they can have on the safety and security and good order of the institution, more or less treating them as units to be held in cold storage. It's kind of like where they throw you away. For instance, I went there, there were guys that were already over there for 10 years. Those guys you might deem crazy or insane. So you have to, you know, be around people who will call you nigga all day or throw feces on you or urine or try to flood out their cell with feces so it comes in your cell, bang on the cell, all, on the walls all night to keep you awake. So it's like, it's a torture chamber, essentially, that's what it is. It's, it's almost like they, and I, when I say they, I mean the system as a whole knows what is going to happen to a person when they send them to DU. You can't not know. Hi-Fi Nation will return after these messages. My name is Eric Williams, I'm 43 years old. I reside in Fall River, Massachusetts. I'm a father, friend, and a full-time maintenance man. <laughs> Eric's road to eight years in solitary began on the streets of Boston and ended the night of the Chow Hall riot with two important turns. There's a misconception I've always had about the American justice system which is that when you're convicted for a crime, you're sentenced to time in a prison cell. And where that cell is and what it looks like is determined by the severity of the crime. It's not really true. It's more accurate to say that you're sentenced to be under the will of a particular department of the state or federal government, the corrections department. Where you live, what you eat, what counts as an infraction and what happens to you afterward are determined by procedures and practices within this department, not in legislatures or courts, not by judges or elected prosecutors. This is Eric's story. I was involved uh, in an altercation with a group of people who attacked the people that I was in a vehicle with. I defended 
the women that I was with and got assaulted in the process. I left the scene, came back with a firearm, opened fire on the people that assaulted us. I was on parole and probation, so I picked up that new case. I waited trial for almost a year and a half. When you're uh, waiting trial, it goes on for two, three years sometimes. And from there, I was sent to um, Walpole. I took everything to trial and was found guilty and uh, subsequently sentenced to about 20, I think I had 20 something years, it was 23, 24 years. I ended up going to Shirley Max because they said I was a gang member. I've never been labeled a gang member, but they have this, this procedure where they can label you a gang member and it essentially keeps you in maximum security prison or prevents you from getting to lower security. And you don't know how that happened? No. And you had no defense? I, I have no defense. They give you the option to denounce the, the gang, but if you're not a gang member, how do you denounce a gang? So if you sign it, you're admitting to being a gang. If you don't sign it, you're sitting. So it's just one of those situations. You just ride it out. I ended up in the um, maximum security prison for that. When you're faced with charges of wrongdoing on the outside, in principle, there's due process, defense counsel, prosecutorial burdens of proof, judicial review. On the inside, the night of the riot, it began with a ticket. So when you catch a ticket, the CO just writes up whatever he wants to write up, and it's your word against his. They hear the evidence. You could call witnesses, but there's a box that says referred to the DA, to the district attorney. So what you say in defense or trying to plead your case at this hearing in jail can ultimately be used against you in a criminal court. So it's better not to say anything. If you say, oh, I hit him because he hit me or whatever, this is now you're admitting to it. You, you can then, they'll then take you to court and you can get more time in court. You so court risk is it. riskier than saying nothing? Because you know what's going to happen is I'm going to be here, they're going to send me to DDU, but I'm not going to get more time in the, oh, in the okay. criminal court. Okay. You know I what see. I mean? So, Extension of your sentence. Right, exactly. I see. So anybody who goes in this hearing is thinking about their, 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 criminal, their, yeah, their right. criminal sentence right, as a, right, versus the time that they're the going to spend. The time they're spending the DDU. Once you have a DDU ticket, it's kind of like given that you're going. The same special hearing officer will be having lunch with the officers that wrote the ticket. So you're pleading your case before a CEO? Before, he's, he's called a special hearing officer, but he's just... He's not a judge? No, he's not a judge. <laughs> okay. He's just a correctional officer who, that's his job, is to hear the DDU hearing. Even a, a minor infraction, if, if the CEO decides to refer it to DDU, then you know you're going to DDU. The most they can give you for a single incident is 10 years, but while you're there, they can give you another 10 years if you pick up another incident, so you have 20 years. The bottom line is, I really can't do anything. Lisa Newman Polk is an attorney and social worker who has clients who have been in DDU or may be placed there. She knows firsthand just how powerless anyone is on the outside to challenge the Department of Corrections on their disciplinary procedures. I can write letters and that's meaningful to my client, but nobody has to listen to anything I have to say. Maybe some of the punishments are justified. Maybe some aren't. Maybe some make her clients repent, while others make them even more dangerous to the public or general population. The point is that neither as a lawyer nor as a social worker is there anything Lisa can do to investigate or defend her clients from any of it. If someone's been sentenced to the DDU for five years, there is zero I can do to stop that from happening. And if there's mistreatment, yes, I can certainly write letters about it. But in Massachusetts, the courts basically said what somebody is inside, it's an administrative issue. And if they feel that somebody uh, needs to be placed in solitary confinement, then that is up to them. Hello, Senator. Hi, Barry. How are you? Massachusetts State Senator Jamie Eldridge is the Senate chair of the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus. Who has the most power right now in stopping the practice of long-term solitary confinement in Massachusetts? Uh, the Department of Corrections does. 
because the Department of Corrections has complete discretion over the use of solitary confinement, they can end it right away. There doesn't need to be a law passed or a governor's instruction. But it's not happening. Any progress is incremental. Last session, when the legislature took up criminal justice reform, uh, we did include legislation that would require a 90-day review for, for every person put in solitary confinement, as well as access to canteen, education, and, and also getting out of, out of that cell at least three hours a day. And so those things became law. Who's doing the 90-day review? Well, that's part of the problem, is that the, the 90-day review is done by the Department of Correction. But shockingly, we have found, and you know, I just recently visited MCI Cedar Junction, formerly Walpole, and MCI Concord, and met with prisoners who have been placed in solitary confinement. And many of them said that the review was really just a, a piece of paper stamped, you know, rejected or approved. Uh, there was no hearing or that you know, many of the prisoners had not even had a review who had been in solitary a number of months. Ideally, who would be doing the review? Like, who, what, what would you want to happen during that review period? What we're asking for now is that that prisoner is provided counsel for the lawyer provided for those reviews, that those reviews happen in person, and if the prisoner uh, it has the right to call witnesses, because often if it's he said, she said, and the Department of Corrections is making the accusation, that it's really not a fair process for the, the prisoner to make his or her case about why he or she should be sent back to general population. Now, I heard that you tried to spend the night at DDU or or one of these institutions. Is, is that true? Can you tell me about that? Yes. Yeah, so so in, in around December 2016, Senator Will Brownsberger and I, and we asked to be placed in a solitary cell at D, DDU, and, and we were denied by the DOC saying, quote, it was not safe for us, which is slightly ironic. So we toured the unit, but if legislators <laughs> or anyone is not safe in the solitary unit, I think it speaks to the basic failures of solitary and, and, and the need for you know, more programming and a more supportive approach for people that may be acting out in prison. Did, did, you buy, did you buy what they said about it not being safe for you, or do you think something else is going on? Not really. I, I assume it was just that they didn't, you know, they didn't want legislators having such a uh, direct inter- interaction with, with prisoners. Because I will say, it's, you know, as much as I you know, am by law, able to go into any prison, and I you know, recently did have one-on-one confidential you know, meetings with prisoners, I can't emphasize enough the power dynamic between the Department of Corrections staff and prisoners, you know, everything from you know, access to canteen to you know, the kind of food they get to you know, also more serious, serious concerns about you know, how, they're, how they're treated in, in their cells. And the Department of Corrections really tries to limit honest conversations between prisoners and legislators. There's a term, civil death, that refers to the condition that prisoners are in when they're subject to the almost complete power of the corrections department. Philosopher Lisa Gunther. If you are civilly dead, you can be punished by law, but you are not protected by law. Civil death descends from another concept that aims to capture the condition of removing a human being from family, friends, and community against their will and subjecting them to the will of another without the kind of reciprocity or protection that family, friends, and communities provide. This concept is called social death. Social death is a term that the historian Orlando Patterson developed to name what he thought was the core structure of slavery. It's not ownership of another person, nor forced labor, but rather this condition of what he calls natal alienation and social death that defines the slave. So natal alienation is the separation of a person from that kinship network that gives their life meaning in a social sense, and that also provides a protective network of support so that if someone 
comes after your kin, you are obliged to protect them and to to defend them. The, the core of the way slavery works, according to Patterson, is to dislodge or separate a single individual from that protective, supportive network so that they can be so radically exploited that they are forced to work without pay or that they are treated as property or as an object. So I was struck by the the way in which this account of social death seemed to name one of the ways in which the prison industrial complex was replicating the logic of slavery. You might think it's an overstatement to equate death and slavery with stripping away a prisoner's legal rights to due process and just procedures of punishment. After all, isn't a conviction just a forfeiture of a person's rights? It's a good question. Just how much of a person's rights and livelihood are supposed to be given up on conviction? If you think the forfeiture of rights is total, well, there's nothing to argue about. You're probably fine with waterboarding, dismemberment, medical experiments, and gladiator fighting. But if you think there are limits, it's worth looking at whether civil and social death is a real phenomenon and whether long-term solitary really is a genuine kind of death sentence. Because if it is, then subjecting someone to a form of death without a just procedure would be morally equivalent to giving a branch of government the power to execute at their own discretion. When we come back, we examine the various forms of death by looking at various forms of life with a little help from phenomenology and existentialism. We'll return to the rest of Hi-Fi Nation after these messages. I just, I think about the, um, how they try to kill your soul. Some philosophers use the term bare life to describe the state of being alive without living a life. Bacteria have bare life. Comatose patients have it too. They have the minimal conditions of being biologically alive, but they're not living in the active sense. And it's an important question, what we need to add to bare life to get a human life, a life of significance and moral worth because prisoners in solitary occupy a liminal space between bear and human life. Their suffering, their deprivation, tells us a lot about the answer. Philosopher Lisa Gunther. Many prisoners describe their experience in solitary confinement as their relation to time has come unraveled. The breakdown in an inmate's experience of time seems to be the root of other common experiences, the feeling of being dead, hallucinations, hypervigilance, and anxiety. All of these features seem to begin with the inability to mark the passage of time. The inmate is unable to locate whether something happened a day or week or year ago. They can't tell what came before and what came after. And more frighteningly, they can't tell from their experience whether they're remembering something or whether they're just imagining something that's yet to happen. When an inmate describes time breaking down in their subjective experience, it isn't that they lack access to external markers of time, like calendars or marks on a wall. It's that what they experience in the first person doesn't feel situated in linear time at all. This kind of breakdown in the temporal order of experiences, seems to happen the longer an inmate is subjected to the repetitive cycle of the prison schedule. I don't know what it does. I don't know what the isolation does to people. So your schedule is Monday, Wednesday, Friday is when you take showers. And you're in your cell 24 hours a day. Can you tell me the dimensions of the cell? I think they are 6 by 12 maybe. 
the size of an average parking space, yeah. You come out for an hour a day, and a, it's a dog kennel. It's probably five feet wide by 12 feet long. and Fenced? Yes, yeah, fenced in. Okay. You go in there, shackle. They take the shackles and cuffs on, and you just walk back and forth in the kennel next to the other guys that are on your tier. Sleep was an issue. You develop these little quirks, like you want to clean your cell all the time. Uh, you don't want to use a mop, so you use a towel. Robert King managed to create pralines, so candies, when he was a prisoner for 29 years in solitary confinement at Angola prison. So he would gather sugar packets from meal trays. He managed to get a tin can and he would use toilet paper to create a little fire and then melt the sugar in the tin can and then make that into candies. Just by do, engaging in this creative work that gets your mind working towards a future that would be different from the endless repetition of the same is a really amazing, imaginative and creative way to take control of the agency to to exist not just in someone else's time schedule, but to actually structure your own possibilities as an agent. The 20th century existentialist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir had this insight about one thing you need to add to bear life to make it a human life. You need to add the experience of your own future as being open to possibilities. Possibilities that are not determined in advance for you. And possibilities that are not determined in advance to be exactly like all of your other experiences. Very deep in Beauvoir is this idea that what it means to be human is to exist in relation to possibilities that are open-ended, that are unforeseeable. The way that Simone de Beauvoir defines oppression is in terms of a, a cleavage or a cutting a part of humanity into those who have a relationship to an open future, those for whom possibilities are live and ongoing and not prescribed or determined in advance, and those who are condemned to endlessly repeat the same thing over and over and over again. De Beauvoir's insight is that a source of social death comes from the way long-term solitary alienates an inmate's experiences from time. By using austere schedules and spaces to extinguish any role an inmate's current actions can have on their future. Well, almost any role. My level of, I guess, violence, all of that increased. I think the recidivism rate for the department it has to be greater than the recidivism rate for somebody coming to the street. I don't know. I can't explain. I don't know why that happens. I just, I've seen it. I've seen everybody that, that comes to DDU. I've seen them almost all come back. Talk a little bit about that first time that you were trying to reintegrate yourself in the general population and, that and what happened. That didn't work well. Yeah, yeah um, let's talk about that. <laughs> Leaving DDU, I was, I was, I was sentenced to four, but I ended up doing five years. When I got out of DDU, I was just, extremely paranoid, extremely anxious, and I ended up stabbing someone. And going back, I was only out for 40 days. The, the thing is, is, is considered you having a behavioral issue instead of a psychological meltdown. <laughs> I was having a meltdown. Do you remember how you felt when you knew you were going back? Relieved. You felt relieved. I've never met anybody that has gone to DDU who doesn't go back. And it's not because they like it. It's because they come accustomed to the, the chaos and, and, and everything that's over there. You know, the, the isolation. The, the, you become accustomed to that. So when, when you're now in population and you, you're seeing people move with the, their hands and they're talking and, and they're around you, you're paranoid. Always somebody's out trying to get you. They want you to go back, they want you to fail, that kind of thing. Because whatever, whatever happened over there, it, it, it's the human lack of human contact. 
And how much longer were you there for the second time? Three years. So did a total of eight years, five years, then three years the second time. There's a pathology to the American approach to criminal punishment that's marked out by our continued use of solitary confinement. It isn't a biological death sentence. It's a civil and social death sentence. But in the correction system, it's deemed by someone somewhere with power as a necessary evil, necessary for safety, necessary as a deterrent, necessary as a deserving punishment for wrongdoing. Yet, when an inmate comes before a parole board or is considered for release to general population, their time in solitary is recognized as making them more dangerous to others. And they are. It again raises the issue, what is a particular practice in criminal justice for? If it's safety, it undermines it. If it's a deterrent, then why is DDU recidivism so high? And why is there a waiting list to get in there? And finally, if it's a last resort way to hold a wrongdoer accountable, then why does it fail in every case? The very meaning of accountability is undermined by the practice of solitary confinement. Accountability, in any meaningful sense, in my view, is the capacity and the obligation to give an account of yourself to someone else. And what we say to someone when we send them into solitary confinement or when we construct prisons that are spaces of more or less permanent exile is that we are not accountable to you and you don't really have to be accountable to anyone else. You just have to behave in such a way that does not become overly disruptive to the order of the institution. And if you do, then we will put a lid on you and we will incapacitate you. Accountability requires capacitation. It requires relationships. It requires the agency of one person to be responsive and responsible for the well-being of others. The insight comes from Emmanuel Levinas, another philosopher of the 20th century. People who are socially and civilly alive constantly experience other people as playing a role in their own future. And they experience themselves as difference makers to the future of other people. When you're stripped of both this vulnerability and power for such a long time, it's no wonder that your reaction to being in that space again is pathological. So for Levinas, the meaning of time is ethical. It's interrelational. What gives time meaning is not primarily my own relation to my own possibilities, my own projects, but the way in which those projects can be interrupted and opened out into unforeseeable horizons by the ethical command of the other. And so if you're living in a space that where you do not share space with other people, it's very difficult, arguably impossible, to undergo that ethical experience that Levinas situates at the core of his philosophy, which is to be faced by another person and to feel at a very deep level that their future matters to you, that their mortality matters to you. So in a nutshell, can you describe the account of personhood that has come out of thinking about the first-person experiences of people in solitary? For me, perhaps the most powerful expression of relational personhood, it's uh, Reverend Desmond Tutu, who defined the African concept of Ubuntu as a person is a person through other persons. For me, this captures the practice of becoming yourself in relation to other people in an ongoing way where we share a world together and we build the world that we're sharing. That is both a beautiful vision and also a very practical understanding that if a person is a person through other persons, then we're vulnerable to one another. And it really matters how we behave and how our actions affect other people, 
And that matters not just in everyday life, but also in state-run, state-managed practices of punishment. This time it was different because my best friend and I had formed a pact to change our lives, to change the narrative. We just wanted different. We both grown up just locked up all the time. That best friend's name was Eugene. Eugene Ivy. Eric and Eugene had known each other since they were teenagers. And Eugene was given 10 years in DDU, which turned into a total of 12 years and 8 months. It so happened that when Eric was sent back to DDU the second time, they were housed together in the same tier, so they could write letters to each other, speak to each other during their hour in the dog kennel. They even communicated through the ventilation system. What they decided to do was start a book club. I remember this book, All God's Children. All God's Children is about Willie Boskett. It essentially broke down a historical overview of his entire family and everyone's criminality. He picked up like a homicide as a juvenile, and he had spent a lot of time in isolation. They would drug him, strongest dose of Thurazine, and it wouldn't do anything to him. He just became extremely violent, uh, extremely paranoid. We related to that story. I mean, we, we read so... I couldn't even tell you all the little books I've read. Anything. That's how you got out of DDU. And, um... We just formed this plan to... to hold each other accountable. From their pact, from their relationship, Eric started to educate himself about legal procedure and the Massachusetts sentencing process. Both got out of DDU, insisted on getting mental health treatment. Eugene got his GED, enrolled in college, even served as a facilitator for conflict resolution in the prison's new restorative justice program. He started training therapy and service dogs. And Eric was able to sue the parole board for procedural violations and eventually win an early release in 2014. Eugene is still locked up, but it's a complicated story. You'll hear about it in our Slate Plus segment this week. I try not to think about that, like, in my, 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 my time out here, I just try not to dwell on it. I've made a lot of uh, strides, so to know that they didn't succeed, the system didn't succeed. If I'm already in prison for a crime, I'm already being punished. I think there comes a point where you have to think about what you're doing to people. Another human. People would be up in arms if a dog was treated the way they treat us. Can't even leave your dog in the car for 20 minutes without someone calling the police. But you can leave a, a person in a box and hope they'll be all right. Hope we're not making a time bomb. Hope we're not. Hope. That's it. Hi-Fi Nation is written, produced, and edited by Barry Lamb, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Vassar College. Editorial Director for Slate Podcasts is Gabriel Roth. Senior Managing Producer for Slate Podcasts is June Thomas. Operations Manager for Slate Podcasts is Asha Saluja. Editor for Slate Plus is me, Chow Tu. 
Our new executive producer for Slate Podcasts is Alicia Montgomery. Production assistance this season provided by Noah Mendoza Goot. Visit HiFiNation.org for complete show notes, soundtrack, and reading list for every episode. That's HiPHINation.org. Follow HiFi Nation on Facebook and Twitter, and at the website for updates on stories and ideas.